Hi everyone, my name is Piers Keen and today I'm going to be talking about transforming healthcare with artificial intelligence. One of the things that I believe is that my own specialty, ophthalmology, is at the forefront of AI-enabled healthcare and can be an example for other medical specialties in that regard. And so over the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we've done and some of the things we've learned during this process. The other thing that I should say is that in the bottom right of this slide, I've included my uh, Twitter handle, and I'm always looking to get more followers in, on Twitter if anyone wants to get in touch with me. But also in the last slide of this presentation, I'll provide, provide my email address if anyone wants to get in touch via that route. So my background is that I am a consultant ophthalmologist at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. Uh, and at Moorfields, I specialize in the treatment of retinal diseases. So this are, these are conditions that affect the back of the eye and include conditions such as age-related macular degeneration, which is the commonest cause of blindness in the UK, in Europe, in the US, and in many other countries, and diabetic eye disease. And diabetic eye disease is the commonest cause of blindness in people of working age in many countries and regions around the world. Now, uh, in addition to my role as a clinician, I'm also an associate professor at the Institute of Ophthalmology at University College London. And although I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not an engineer and don't really have any specialized technical expertise, I have somehow come to find myself leading a diverse multidisciplinary uh, research group that aims to develop and apply artificial intelligence in healthcare. And as I said at the start, using ophthalmology as an exemplar for other medical specialties. Now, I'm also very fortunate to be funded by UK Research and Innovation as one of their Future Leaders Fellows. And the exciting thing about that, at least for me, is that I have 80% of my time protected for research. So I only spend about one day a week in clinics. And so that um, really empowers me to be able to collaborate with uh, amazing computer scientists and engineers and uh, many other academic disciplines. The other thing that I just want to highlight, especially given the nature of my talk, is that I do have some financial disclosures, in particular that I've acted as an external consult consultant for the artificial intelligence company DeepMind. So why do we need new technologies and innovation in healthcare and in particular in ophthalmology? Well, this is a slide that I love to show, particularly to other medical specialties, because in other parts of medicine, there is a perception that, that ophthalmology is somehow a niche medical specialty. But in fact, since 2017, ophthalmology has surpassed orthopedics in the National Health Service in the, in the United Kingdom as the busiest of all medical specialties in terms of clinic appointments. So nearly 10% of all clinic appointments in the NHS per year are for eyes, and that constitutes nearly 10 million appointments per year. And furthermore, that's a number that's been rising a lot in recent years. And the fact is, to put it in a kind of brutal, uh, brutal framing, we are drowning in the numbers of patients that we need to see. And uh, as a result of that, there are some people that lose sight and sometimes irreversibly lose sight because of delays in being seen and treated. And of course, this is not just a problem in Moorfields or in the UK, but it's a problem in eye clinics around the world. And so one of the things I believe is that artificial intelligence may play at least some role in beginning to address this. And when I'm talking about AI, um, really, uh, I'm talking about deep learning um, uh, for the most part. And so over the last five or six years, as everyone attending this conference will know, um, deep learning has led to reinvention, reinvention of the tech industry. Of course, the New York Times famously described that as the great AI awakening in 2016. But it's also started to come into other areas, in particular in healthcare. So some of the first and most influential clinical applications of deep learning um, have been in things like dermatology. So one of the seminal papers in this area was from Sebastian Troon's group from Stanford, published in Nature in 2017. And essentially, uh, as many of you will be aware, they essentially got about 130,000 photographs of skin lesions. And they, these were either labeled as benign or malignant skin lesions. And they trained a deep learning model to be able to distinguish between the two. Now, when they compared, when they evaluated the performance of that model on an independent test set, what they were able to show was that the performance was on par with uh, 20 board certified US trained dermatologists. So think about what are the implications of that for dermatologists, for ophthalmologists, for other healthcare professionals, and most importantly, what are the implications of that for patients? 
So where I come into this is that in July 2016, I initiated a formal research collaboration agreement between my hospital, Moorfields, and the artificial intelligence company DeepMind. Now, of course, DeepMind knows, needs no introduction, but essentially they were founded in, in London in 2012 and they were acquired by Google in 2014, reputedly for about £400 million. And the really exciting thing from my perspective is that two of the three co-founders are from London. Two of the three co-founders are alumni of UCL, which is, of course is affiliated with Moorfields, and their headquarters are based in King's Cross. So just two stops away from Moorfields uh, on the London Underground. Now, uh, when I approached them, the idea wasn't anything particularly, um, you know, uh, uh, novel or genius, but essentially it was that we would work together to apply deep learning to something called OCT scans. OCT stands for Optical Coherence Tomography, and these are extremely high-resolution, three-dimensional images of the retina. <clears throat> so just to let you know by way of comparison, the ax axial resolution of an OCT scan is about five micrometers. So that's an order of magnitude better resolution than an MRI or a CT scanner. And OCT has become the dominant imaging modality <coughs> in all of ophthalmology. Now, we started the collaboration formally in 2016. <coughs> and so then um, it was tremendously exciting that in August 2018, we were able to publish the first results of this work. And as you can see, we published this in Nature Medicine. And as you can see, there's more than 30 different co-authors in the paper, reflecting the fact that we had really multidisciplinary input from clinicians in uh, more fields, from researchers in UCL, and from computer scientists and engineers uh, at DeepMind. <clears throat> now, it was also tremendously exciting that it was uh, featured on the cover of Nature Medicine. And of course, this being AI, you can't escape the hype. And so um, it was both... Uh, satisfying, but also a little bit awkward that it received uh, global media attention. So why do I say satisfying? Well, you know, the fact is that I published uh, quite a few research papers prior to this, and many of them I've, I've really felt passionate about, but then really have probably only been read by about five people. And so it was nice to see um, you know, your research getting more widespread attention, but also a little bit awkward. Because the fact of the matter is that despite the newspaper headlines, we have not saved the sight of millions of people yet. And in fact, we have not saved the sight of even a single person yet with this system. Uh, and in fact, um, the algorithm that we published a proof of concept of in this paper in Nature Medicine is not yet being used in the real world at Moorfields or in other locations. And that's something I'd like to tell you a little bit more about in a moment. Before I do, I thought I'd show you the algorithm in action. So this is, um, there's a lot going on here, but essentially if you look on the bottom row, what you can see is we feed a raw OCT volume scan into the first of two neural networks. The first neural network is a segmentation network that essentially has been trained to delineate between 10 and 15 different anatomic features on the OCT scan. You can see the legend for that in the bottom right. Now, in this case, this is a patient in their 40s with poorly controlled diabetes, and you don't have to be an ophthalmologist to figure out that there is a lot of swelling or waterlogging of the retina, and this is called macular edema. And then the second row, you can see two-dimensional heat maps of the intraretinal fluid accumulation and the thickening of the neurosensory retina. Now, that segmentation network then feeds into a second neural network, which provides a classification output. In this case, it recommends a semi-urgent referral, and it gives a diagnosis probability of 98.5% for macular retinal edema, which is the commonest cause of visual impairment in patients with diabetes. So where are we with this algorithm in 2021? Well, we're trying to bridge what we call the AI chasm. And this is a term that uh, Eric Topol and I borrowed from the tech world. Uh, it was an article that we read in TechCrunch a number of years ago. And basically in the tech world, the idea of the AI chasm is that, you know, if you're a machine learning startup, it's one thing to do a cool demo and raise some funding. It's actually a very, very different thing to have a scalable deployment and meaningful human AI interactions. And if you've got that sort of chasm in the tech world, you can imagine that the chasm is an order of magnitude bigger in a field like healthcare, which is so tightly regulated. Now, why is there this chasm? Well, there's a number of areas where you which you have to address. So firstly, there's something around the technical maturity of the algorithms. And so one of the things that we've had to do, 
and when I say we, I mean some of the talented engineers uh, based at Google Health, is actually take the model, take the piece of experimental code that we use for the Nature Medicine paper and rewrite it from the ground up um, so that it becomes a cloud-based API and so that effectively it runs in a fraction of the time with a fraction of the computing power. And the exciting thing for me is that we actually did a live demonstration of this rewritten uh, system at Wired Health at the Francis Crick Institute uh, at the start of 2019. Now it seems like a long time ago now, pre-pandemic. Um, so really the way that I would explain this to kind of non-expert audiences is, is to say what we've done with the Nature Nature paper in 2018 is that we've we've built a prototype car and you know we've used it to beat the world land speed record but it was only able to do this with the input of you know 20 amazing computer scientists and engineers to make that happen and what we're trying to do now is see how we can make this into a production car a car that can be used by millions of people in a reliable and safe way all around the world of course there's a considerable challenge to that now the other i think uh, major issue is around clinical validation of these systems and um you know, I was fortunate to play a small role in one of the first major systematic reviews and meta-analyses of deep learning in the context of medical imaging, which was published in 2019. And the long story short with that is that we looked at more than 14,000 papers and conference proceedings with regard to deep learning and medical imaging. And we found that less than half a percent of those 14,000 were methodologically robust, at least from a clinical validation perspective. And so we really need to move towards much stronger, um, you know, clinical validation of these systems. So we're already beginning to do that in the context of the work with DeepMind. And so one of the things that we're doing is making sure that an algorithm that's been trained on data from, from London uh, works just as well in patients with, uh, with retinal disease in Accra, in Ghana, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Mexico City, Mexico, Detroit, Michigan, and a number of other locations around the world. And we hope to be able to publish the results of that in the coming year. The other major blocker is that, you know, even if you've got a technically mature, clinically validated algorithm, before it can be used in patients, you have to receive regulatory approval. And in particular, the biggest and most important regulatory approval, I think it's fair to say, is from the US uh, Food and Drug Administration. Now, the problem with that is that that requires a hell of a lot of paperwork and it requires a hell of a lot of resources to achieve. And so you typically be talking about at least a million dollars in funding and possibly considerably more, depending on um, the nature of the AI system and many, many years of effort. And of course, that's not something that's possible without significant uh, resources to achieve. Now, even when you do get FDA approval, the next question is who's going to pay for it? And so in the UK, are NICE going to approve it? In the US, will it be approved? And at what tariff levels will the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services approve it? Or will private insurers approve it? And so this is also a considerable barrier because if it doesn't have appropriate economic model, then really it's never going to be widely used. And then even if you have that, the next thing is, will healthcare professionals actually use it or will there be flexibility within hospital systems to adopt it? Now, at Moorfields, we are uh, building a new hospital in the King's Cross area of London in the next year or two. And we're already beginning to design that in such a way that we can have the flexibility to take advantage of new pathways of care. And one of the other things that we're particularly interested in the context of ophthalmology is how we can better link hospital eye services with community optometry uh, settings and with family practices and even with patients in their home. And so for me, the promise of artificial intelligence and ophthalmology is really about how we can bring world-class expertise out of the hospital into the community and perhaps even closer to patients in their own homes. And that will hopefully greatly transform the quality of life of patients with chronic eye disease. Now, in the last five minutes of, of the lecture, I just wanted to um, speculate and maybe even make a few kind of prov semi-provocative statements about what I think is an emerging ecosystem for clinical AI. Now, much of the work that I've done, or at least in the early stages of my involvement in, in deep learning, has been with industry, and so particular DeepMind and, and Google. 
um, but more recently, increasingly working with amazing uh, collaborators within academia. So I think of people like Danny Alexander at UCL Center for Medi Medical Image Computing and, and a number of others. But one of the things that I believe is that in the coming years, we're going to see increasing shift whereby domain experts, in particular clinical researchers, are going to play an increasing role in the development and validation of clinical AI systems. Now, part of the reason for this is because I think that the technical expertise that's required to develop deep learning systems is, is um, the barrier is, is, is reducing rapidly. Now, part of the reason I say that is because um, there are now a number of automated deep learning platforms or code-free deep learning platforms from all the major tech companies that essentially provide drag and drop interfaces that allow you to, to generate your own image classifiers and even uh, deploy those models. Now, when I read about these, I got tremendously excited because, as I said at the start, I don't have any computer science or engineering expertise. And maybe in some senses, I've always been secretly envious of the, you know, some of the brilliant computer scientists that I've been able to work with. And so when we, when we saw this, uh, myself and a number of other clinical researchers in our group downloaded a number of public medical image data sets. So we downloaded some skin cancer data sets that are publicly available. We downloaded some chest x-rays, both from adults and, and children that are publicly available. We downloaded some OCT scans, and we downloaded some retinal photographs. And we started to use one of these platforms, in our case, AutoML Vision from Google Cloud. And the amazing thing was that um, within days, we were getting results that were comparable to state of the art. And you can't imagine how exciting that is for us as clinicians to be able to begin to dabble in this field. Now. Uh, as I said, our initial work was with AutoML Vision, but in fact, there's now a number of platforms available from all the major tech companies and from a number of smaller companies also. And so in March of this year, we actually published uh, a, a paper in this area where we compared the, these code-free deep learning platforms for medical image classification. We compared the pros and cons of all of the different platforms. And the TLDR with that is that actually there's a number of these platforms that are, are pretty good and pretty comparable in performance and pretty comparable in ease of use. So we think that there's huge potential for this. Now, of course, there's lots of caveats to what I've just said. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that we're not, we're not for even a second beginning to suggest that like a medical student could go out uh, or a junior doctor could train an AI system and start to use that for care of patients anytime soon. Because, of course, in the first part of my talk, I highlighted that even for the absolute world-leading bespoke uh, deep learning systems, that it's a considerable challenge to move them from code to clinic. And, and that considerable clinical validation is required before this can be done. And that would, of course, also hold with any sort of auto-ML, automated deep learning systems. Now... Uh, and of course, the other thing to highlight, as many of you will be thinking, is that there is far more to um, machine learning and data science than simply, you know, uh, tweaking the hyperparameters of a neural network. And in fact, one of the things we really believe is that by sort of um, making this technology easier to access, that it'll be really, really helpful for the education of doctors and, and other healthcare professionals in artificial intelligence. So for example, we can start to learn a little bit better about the, the kind of bear traps that, that uh, machine learning experts are so aware of. Things like test train leakage, things like class imbalance, and a range of other things. And so in fact, um, I, I wrote a, a short essay about this topic in uh, The Lancet with Eric Topol in April of this year. And we just highlighted that um, these platforms, particularly when combined with publicly available medical image data sets, may provide perfect sand pits for healthcare professionals to begin to learn about both the strengths and weaknesses of AI-enabled healthcare. Now, slightly related to that, I just wanted to highlight that uh, a book that I really love and have been influenced by is Deep Thinking from Gary Kasparov. And I love in particular the last chapter of this book, which essentially highlights that um, after Gary Kasparov lost to deep learning, that people didn't stop playing chess. So in fact, people started to train to play chess using chess computers. 
and that had some profound effects. So it meant that uh, human experts beca- uh, were able to become grandmasters at a far earlier age than before. And it also meant that there's now an, a much wider geographical distribution of chess playing talent than there was before. And one of the things that I believe is that uh, artificial intelligence tools can do the same in terms of medical diagnostics. If it took me 10 years to become an expert in in OCT interpretation, I'll bet you that I could get a medical student to become just as good, if not better, in 10 10 months or even 10 weeks with the right data set, with the right uh, uh, AI system that can give real-time feedback, and with the right teaching algorithms to optimize the way in which data is presented. So just to finish up then, you know, I hope over the, the course of the last 20 minutes, I've begun to make the case that there is potential to reinvent the eye examination for the 21st century using new technologies such as artificial intelligence and in particular deep learning. And then lastly, as promised, uh, if anybody uh, would like to get in touch with me with any other questions, um, uh, I try to answer all my emails. Uh, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much.